We begin the day at the starting line of the race for the White House. Next week, voters in Iowa will hold caucuses all across the state, meetings, Democrats, Republicans, having their say on who should be their party's candidate for president. And what I'm about to tell you is no spoiler, Donald Trump will most likely be the winner among Republicans in Iowa. Now, this is happening just a little more than three years since Trump loyalists stormed the U.S. Capitol, claiming that Joe Biden had stolen the 2020 presidential election. President Biden says that January 6th was a day when America almost lost its democracy. And he says that very threat is as clear and present as ever. I want you to take a listen to what he said today inside a church in South Carolina. After the Civil War, the defeated Confederates couldn't accept the verdict of the war. They had lost. So they say they embraced what's known as the lost cause. Now, now we're living in an era of a second lost cause. Once again, there's some in this country trying, trying to turn a loss into a lie. We all saw with our own eyes the truth of what happened. That violent mob was whipped up by lies from a defeated former president. The same movement that throughout the mob the United States Capitol isn't just trying to rewrite history, January 6th. They're trying to determine to erase history and your future. Banning books, denying your right to vote and have it counted, destroying diversity, equality, inclusion all across America, harboring hate and replacing hope with anger and resentment and dangerous view of America. Well, for more on what is at stake in this year's U.S. presidential election, I'm happy to welcome back to the show Gloria J. Brown Marshall. She's a professor of constitutional law at John Jay College in New York. She's the author of numerous books on voting rights and race relations in America. Professor, it's good to have you back on the program. President Biden, I'm sure you were listening in. He was speaking to this long arc of history today. American democracy after the Civil War, American democracy in the polarized present. I mean, do you agree that the stakes are indeed that great? Are we talking about an existential moment for American democracy now? We certainly are. And unfortunately, the risk to democracy is not just a risk in the United States, because if Donald Trump becomes president again, he's already decided he's going to regret vengeance on anyone who opposes him, especially the so-called enemies he already has in the government and anybody who didn't vote for him before. But he's also going to join with other strong men, dictators around the country, I mean, around the world, and create havoc around the globe. It will not just rest within the borders of the United States. There will be, I would say, perhaps World War III if he is allowed to join with other dictators and put in place the nationalist themes that he's already advocated in the United States. I mean, that's quite a statement to make, Professor. I, I just want to ask you, if you, when you say World War III, what, would, would, what war or what country would you see America being fighting against? Well, you start thinking about it when you go across the globe. You see the Philippines and what they elected. You see in um, Eastern Europe the um, presidents that are elected there. When you begin to see that, it didn't take much, as you know, this is mm -hmm. your history, for one country to gather with another, where there was only, you know, for example, Japan, Italy, and Germany to create World War II. So if you think about that, it doesn't take a number of other countries, but if they are geographically, strategically placed and their animosity to democracy is as strong as Donald Trump's, and he has looked and reached out to these dictators, he's studied them. He's actually talked about the fact that he doesn't believe in voting rights. He believes in his supporters alone. And if he doesn't win, then there's something wrong with the mechanism we call a democracy. I, I'm fearful that other people in other countries Countries think this is just an American problem. It's not just a problem for the United States. Donald Trump is a problem for the world if he gets in office again. I want to go back in time for a moment with you to the U.S. Civil War, which ended in 1865. That has become something of a campaign issue. The Republican candidate, Nikki Haley, she um, failed to mention that slavery 
um, was the reason for the war when she was asked about it a couple of weeks ago. I, I want you to take a listen to what Donald Trump had to say about it at a campaign event in Iowa. The Civil War was so fascinating, so horrible. So many mistakes were made. See, there was something I think could have been negotiated, to be honest with you. I think you could have negotiated that. All the people died. So many people died. You know, that was the disaster. So that's Donald Trump you know, saying that he would have been able to negotiate a, a ceasefire. I, I don't want to talk about that, but I want to ask you, why do you think in the United States it's still so difficult, particularly for politicians, to talk about the Civil War and to talk about that part of our past? Well, what they could learn from Germany and I, what I've learned in my visits there is that you have to look at the past in order to understand the present and go forward. This country refuses to look at its past. It refuses to look at the Civil War or any of these heinous things because the identity of many white Americans in particular is that of someone who's um, generous and loving and, and believes in God and believes in liberty and built a country and the country became very powerful and therefore people are jealous of us in other parts of the world where there is nothing that's spoken about how this country was built, that the land was stolen from the Native Americans, that Native Americans, many of them slaughtered, that people were kidnapped by the hundreds of thousands and perhaps millions from Africa and brought here by force and under law and penalty of death, forced to work to give their physical and intellectual um, currency to this country. And that's how the country was built. Nor does this country even realize the Northerners who mm -hmm. leave themselves so liberal that without the African American soldier during the Civil War, the Union or North would have lost. So mm -hmm. there's so little that we've studied about our own Civil War, and yet we put our finger in, in the in the nose of other people in, in their civil conflicts. And I think that the identity of most white Americans is, is so in opposite um, to what history actually shows. Not everyone is perfect. We're not asking people to be perfect, but we are asking people to be realistic yeah. about their history and about how this country was developed and how it's been maintained using racism as well. So, so where do things um, go moving forward? What is at stake for uh, minorities in the United States in this presidential election? I'm so glad you asked that because that clip you showed of Donald Trump, of of um, President Biden talking about Donald Trump mm. was the church where black parishioners were slain mm -hmm. by a white supremacist. And that is something that we don't even talk about. That's why when we're talking about the white identity, they believe themselves to be so holy and pure. And yet these types of, of violent actions have been taking place throughout American history. When um, President Biden was talking about the time after this, the Civil War, there were slaughters by angry whites of thousands of black people. No trials took place. There were um, no people who were actually uh, given sentences for this, but, but no Professor, charges, the prosecutors didn't prosecute. Professor, let me just ask you, that. I mean, I, I take your point there, but, but what about President Biden? He, he is a white American and he was speaking inside that church today. He made the decision to speak there because of what happened then. Isn't that owning up to your history and, and being honest, looking in the mirror and, you know, admitting what, what has happened? I mean, isn't that what he's doing? And that's where we were going. As a nation, we were going in that direction. Remember, it's almost as though we didn't have two terms of Barack Obama as president. Mm -hmm. And then you have the backlash. And that is what America does. It goes forward two steps and then back again. And so now we're going back and the struggle is of certain people want to remain in positions of power. And Donald Trump is a reckoning for the power of the black vote, which will be suppressed if, if Donald Trump becomes president again, the militarization of the police. We still have over well, a thousand people, civilians killed by the police every year. And Professor, all of those things are, are a struggle in this country let, between white, black and good people. Let me ask you about, about the black vote. Um, the polls show that support for President Biden has fallen among African Americans, and they are the very group of voters who helped push him to the nomination back in 2020. I'm thinking about South Carolina, for example, and then finally to victory. Why is this support falling? Why can't he keep 
the support of this key group? Well, African-Americans are human like everyone else. <laughs> and sometimes there are people who make decisions based on the sense of who they think is going to win, who's the most vibrant. And sometimes Joe Biden does not look that vibrant to some younger people. And also, even though things are not as bad, they haven't really drastically improved for the African-American community under Joe Biden. It will be worse under Donald Trump, but there needs to be this sense of improvement, this sense of hope for something better. And right now, it's not getting better. It just hasn't gotten worse. And so there are many young people who are wondering, when are we going to have the fruit of our labor actually recognized. And I mm. think they've become very disenchanted with the whole system, not just with Joe Biden, with the whole system of voting. Why are they voting when they're saving America in so many elections, and yet they're not realizing their American dream at the end of the day? Well, yeah, when you when you say, you know, we, we keep waiting, there is a sense in uh, among Americans, but I think among voters um, here in Europe as well, that the, the generation that's in power now um, is, is holding on to power and that you don't have a renewal coming up for the next generation. I mean, is it, do you blame that on the parties, the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States? Is, is it the party apparatus that is failing to provide, you know, new blood for, their, for the candidates, for the, for the campaigns? It's, it's so true. Where do you see people being nurtured in the next generations? I mean, the, the greatest generation and then the next generation after that, um, they believe that they're the only ones who have the answers. They believe that they're the only ones who could give the solutions to whatever the problem may be and that the rest of us are still in learning mode. And once we learn well enough, we'll be able to be in positions of power too. So many of them are dying in positions of power without nurturing the next generation. Mm -hmm. And so we have a pipeline that's stopped up because we don't have forced retirement anymore. And if you say anything about retirement, you could be sued. So we have people who have been waiting for their chance. And, and I know my generation and generations after mine are still waiting for the generations right. above us to actually move over so that we can have an opportunity to lead as well. So before we run out of time, I, I want to ask you for a solution. What, what could happen that would be productive, in, in your opinion, for American democracy as we move towards Election Day? Do, I mean, do you, do you see any silver lining here? The silver lining I see is if we have um, the opportunity for people to actually have their voices heard on platforms, not just social media platforms, but platforms like this one, platforms across the country. There used to be a time where you could go into a theater or into uh, other places, auditoriums, and have debates about these issues. Mm -hmm. We're not able to have those debates because they become so raucous. We need to be able to have conversations across these different issues with different opinions and find out what our commonality is. That's the hope. What is common among us and not what divides us? Yeah. And we haven't been able to get there and we really need to be able to do that. Yep. Building some bridges. We certainly need to work on that infrastructure. That is for sure. Constitutional law professor and author Gloria J. Brown Marshall. Professor, it's good to have you on. Thank you. Thank you.